It's Red Eye Radio. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley talk about everything from politics to social issues and news of the day. Whether you're up late or you're just starting your day, welcome to the show. From the Uniden America Studios, this is Red Eye Radio. All across America and around the world, we are Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Harley and I'm Gary McNamara. Good morning. You know, I, I really think that Republicans, you know, we've talked about things they should market. And one of the things they should market is if you can't identify a woman, how can you serve in Congress? If you can't identify a woman, how can you serve in the Supreme Court? Right. If you can't identify a woman, how can you serve in government at all? Right. And this goes back to when Justice uh, 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 Jackson was being nominated in the nomination hearing. And she couldn't identify what a woman was. And we thought the Republicans should have made a big deal of that. And they didn't. They blew it. Mm -hmm. Because it would simply be this. Excuse me. That makes you unqualified to serve on the Supreme Court of the United States. If you cannot identify a woman, if you don't know what a woman is, how can you rule on any federal case involving women? There's no way you can have an opinion if you can't. If you can't define it. And we were furious because when that happened, we were like, okay, somebody's got to be loaded for bear on this one and go for it. Nobody did. Nope, not one. And we were just livid because that was, I mean, that had the power. That had the power to make people at least realize how ridiculous this narrative is coming from the left Mm -hmm. but it's true though legally how can you rule and we asked the question to democrats of course you never get any answers anymore Mm -hmm. but we asked how can you rule on any issue unless all democrats are behind men taking over everything from women right that's the only answer you can get well we don't know need to know what a woman is we know what a man is (laughs) and so (laughs) women don't matter only men do yeah Women aren't relevant. <laughs> Women aren't relevant to Democrats anymore. Women are not relevant to feminists anymore. Only what a man thinks. We can actually make that case. We can make. No, that's the point. Yeah. We can make that case that that's where they stand. Yep. And so here we go again. You had the Education Secretary Cardona testifying before the House Appropriations Committee mm. on budget things. So it came up. Yeah. Yep, And he won't answer the question saying, I'm here to talk about budget things. He goes, well, this is a budget thing. How can you budget for anything with women in schools and Title IX when you can't identify what a woman is? Right. So let's hear part of this yesterday. This was Representative Andrew Clyde uh, going uh, with it with uh, with Cardona on it, by the way, which is a totally legitimate question. Tell us where that question is flawed. Wait a minute. You're talking about a budget. We talk about women's programs. If you can't identify what a woman is. How can we make sure that the money is properly allocated to where it's supposed to be allocated for women? Right. When you can identify what a woman is. Right. Here we go. All right. Chairman Adderholt for holding this hearing today. In recent years, uh, we have seen a drastic increase in radical gender ideology being promoted and pushed by government bureaucrats and educators through school curriculums. Pseudoscientists are attempting to redefine gender to include an individual's feelings rather than focus on their biological sex at birth. And our nation's top executive branch officials cannot clearly define what a woman is. So, Mr. Secretary, I'm sure you remember that in our last hearing last year, I gave you an opportunity to answer that question, and I'll give you a second chance. Can you define what a woman is? I'll respond, uh, Congressman Klein, the way I did last Clyde, the way I did last year. I'm here to talk about the budget and how to support the students in your district. Well, I think it's very important that you determine that you know how to define a woman. As Ms. Frankel mentioned over there, she wanted to be sure that men, that women had their fair share of funding. If you can't define what a woman is, how in the world can you determine that they get their fair share of funding? If you cannot, if you cannot understand and clearly define what a woman is, how can you make rules that protect women's rights? You can't. So I would ask you to please respect this committee and the U.S. Congress by answering my question. I respect uh, your role. I respect this committee. And I 
said I'm here to talk about the budget, and if you have a question about the budget, I'd be happy to respond. I, I'm asking you a question, and you're refusing to answer. Be happy to respond to questions about the budget, which is why I'm here. Um, you're here to answer whatever questions I want to ask of you, and this question directly correlates to the budget. We are asking for a $22 million increase for the Office for Civil Rights so that we can... That's not my question. Done. My question is, can you define a woman? As I said earlier, I, All right. I am not interested okay. in... Okay, so you're getting not in interested in respecting the question of a member of Congress. Content. All right. <clears throat> your answer is cagey, evasive, and reveals to me that your inability, you have an inability to serve and protect the interests of young women, especially women athletes in this country. Female athletes are having their safety and rights violated by biological males competing in women's sports. And as a result, our nation's women and young girls are suffering the consequences. Yet despite the grave need for protections to cover female athletes, the Department of Education is moving to eradicate these protections by redefining gender in clear contradiction to biology through its proposed Title IX rulemaking. Mr. Secretary, I hope you realize this proposed rule unilaterally forces schools to allow biological males to participate in women's athletics, thereby threatening to withhold, by threatening to withhold federal assistance from schools across the nation, assistance that is currently used to benefit all students, I might add. So do you think a woman's safety is in jeopardy by allowing biological males who claim to be women to compete in women's sports. All students should feel welcome and connected to our schools, and the protection of students is something we take very seriously. We are, as you know, in a uh, rulemaking process for Title IX. I can't get into specifics on what our proposal will be. I can tell you that we have had hundreds of thousands of comments that we take very seriously, comments that have different perspectives, which is why it's really important that we listen and we read all those comments before we uh, respond with a rule. Okay, um, but you haven't answered my question. Do you think women's safety is in jeopardy by allowing biological males who claim to be women to compete in women's sports? I believe all students should be safe in school and should be protected, and all students should be welcome uh, in our schools. Again, I see okay, that you so want to... Okay, so you're not going to answer my question. Could you no, I'll tell you something. Response, sir? I'm very thankful... Could I finish my No, no you're, you're not answering my question. You're filibustering. I'm very thankful that the NAIA, the National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics, has decided to only allow biological female student athletes to participate in female sports. The NAIA understands. They understand the safety issue here. They understand that it protects women's achievements. They understand the hard work of women needs to be honored. And it the NAIA understands that they need to prevent the stealing of future honor and accomplishments from women by allowing biological men to take those honors, honors that, that, and hard work that women have worked years and years and years to accomplish, and yet it's not happening. There you go. Pure insanity. Absolute insanity. I mean, it's just... And you know the whole thing by not wanting to define a woman? You're erasing womanhood completely. You want yep. they want to erase womanhood completely. Right. These and these are feminists. Feminists new role to erase womanhood. They don't I mean, care about just, women's rights. They, no, if I was I mean, my God, I you would think that women would be protesting this like nothing ever before. Mm -hmm. Because Democrats are just saying women don't exist. We won't even define you. Yep. You don't even have a definition. You're wiped out. Your definition is gone. You don't exist. Not important. You're yeah. very unimportant. And why? Because the man said so. Well, you heard it from the man right there. Yeah. By the way, when he said, I would have, I would have caught him also because... When the second answer he answered was not a budget question. And he can, he's, wait a minute, you just answered a non-budget question there. Right. So you're trying to evade me because you can't do it. By the way, I'd be tougher on these people, by the way. I'd be mm -hmm. in their face. Yeah. You know, I, I, I really, I'd, I'd be, I'd be Bob Ulinsky. You're asking the Bob American Ulinsky taxpayer them. to fund your agenda. Yeah. How dare you, how dare you come in here and you can't define a woman. How dare you want to erase women? Who the, what kind of sexist, misogynist? I'd throw these things out. 
Those are definitions of 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 what's going on right now. You want to destroy it's, it's Title a, IX. Right. You want to destroy Title IX. And that's what you're you, asking for. You're asking for money to destroy Title IX and just destroy women's rights, and I won't have any of it. But it gets back to what we've always said. How come nobody in this administration can answer a question directly on what they believe? How are they not championing their cause at every turn? Yeah. You should be shouting it at every opportunity, and they don't. They hide from it. Why? Of Why? All, of all the questions in the world, since Justice Jackson said she didn't know what a woman was, mm. Which were Dem- Republicans lost a great moment of opportunity there, mm-hmm. just blew it mm-hmm. big time. Good job, Republicans in the Senate on that yeah. one. Yeah, because that is a simple one. Then you can't. Then if you can't identify a woman, you can't serve in the Supreme Court of the United States. You're disqualified because I want at that point Democrats to try to defend her. Yeah, go ahead. Right, you can't. The, the reason that Cardona, the reason that you have Mayorkas, the reason that you have Justice Jackson, the reason that they all, you know, give you these insane answers that aren't answers, that are non-answers, and they're afraid to promote what they believe is they know that in the arena of ideas, they can't defend it, and they would be defeated big time. Yep. And then so they just ignore it as if it doesn't exist. And they go ahead and do what the public doesn't want to do while claiming all they care about is treating everybody fair, uh-huh. except, except wiping the definition of a woman off the books. Yeah. They'll treat everyone fair except women. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And why? Because the man said so. 866-90-RED-EYE. This morning's USDA Farm Report is brought to you by Howes Products. Tested, trusted, guaranteed since 1920. The latest USDA topsoil moisture condition numbers for the period ending April 7th indicate... Nationally, we see topsoil moisture 30%, very short to short. That's a two-point improvement from last week's 32%. And we see 12% of the nation with surplus topsoil moisture. That is up three points from last week's 9%. Most of the week-over-week changes, according to USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey, originate from last week's storm system that covered the Midwest mid-Atlantic and northeast. In the eastern Corn Belt, we're now seeing significant surpluses in Ohio coming in at 68% surplus, also 35% surplus in Indiana. And then we've also seen some wet weather in the south. Numbers are above 30% surplus in Arkansas. 38% is the number for April 7th. Rippy adds that some key ag areas still have varying degrees of dryness. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. This report brought to you by Cenex Fuels and Lubes. Coming up, more with Gary McNamara and Eric Harley. It's Red Eye Radio. It's Red Eye Radio. He's Eric Carly, and I'm Gary McNamara. Welcome and good morning. Uh, I saw this from the uh, the, the Free Press, uh, Barry Weiss's uh, website, mm-hmm. that uh, brings the report. And I think this is why the National Health Service in Great Britain stopped with the hormone treatments and operations uh. for transgenders. The U.K. mistreated kids with gender dysphoria for years. A damning new report reveals how a National Health Service failed to care for deeply distressed children. The accusation we have made against the radical transgender movement here in the United States. They don't care. How are you not dealing with the mental health crisis in that population? Uh, The report uh, out this week, uh, written by British... Uh, pediatrician Dr. Hillary Cass. The Cass review took nearly uh, is nearly 400 pages long. Took more than four years to compile. Came up with the following conclusions: hmm. Thousands of vulnerable young people were given life-altering treatments with no good evidence on the long-term outcomes of interventions 
to manage gender-related distress. It has been suggested that hormone treatment reduces the elevated risk of death by suicide in this population, but the evidence found did not support this conclusion. Social justice ideology is driving medical decision-making, and the tox- uh, toxicity of the debate has created an environment where professionals are so afraid to openly discuss their views. Activists insist the science on the matter is settled, but Cass's tone recalls a stern British nanny calmly explaining to unruly children how to get their room in order. She shows us that everything about this issue is unsettled and unsettling. For instance, she notes that social transition, when very young children assume other gender identities, is an act of intervention that may set use on a path to medical transition, and it may even make gender dysphoria worse. The review commissioned by the National Health Service comes after more than a decade of whistleblowing uh, from the country's Gender Identity Development Services, which was established in 1989, but mostly off the radar for the first 20 years because few children and families sought the services. These whistleblowers detailed how kids were fast-tracked to medication while a culture of fear grew around raising any concerns, even as demand for youth gender medicine exploded. Eventually, the NHS decommissioned this group and hired the neutral no-nonsense cast no-nonsense cast, to detail what went wrong and what to do right moving forward. Her report made damning conclusions. Doctors are unable to reliably predict which children young people will transition successfully and which might regret or detransition at a later date. They have no idea. The disproportionate number of patients were birth registered females presenting in adolescence a different cohort that looked uh, from a different cohort from that looked at by earlier studies. Many parents feared their children had been medicalized by professionals who didn't take other difficulties into account, such as loss of a parent, traumatic illness, diagnosis of neurodiversity, and isolation or bullying in schools. There is a lack of strong evidence to show that puberty blockers may improve gender dysphoria over or overall mental health. The majority of gender dysphoric patients in early studies found that their symptoms uh, desisted during puberty, with most later on coming out as gay or bisexual. Cass noted that for most young people, a medical pathway will not be the best way to manage their gender-related distress. She supports expanding the treatment to, to regional centers, essentially ending the specialist gender clinic model, The treatment should be based on unbiased psychological care and robust and consistent evaluation tools, which must be developed so reliable evidence can finally be gathered. Hmm. As we're saying, massive psychological help is needed in this instance. And and the approach in general, why in the world would you go, would you approve? of life-altering, in some cases, irreversible procedures without properly going through every single measure to vet that with every individual. It's because you're on an agenda, because you believe you're being a hero. And you know why it's going to end in the United States? Lawsuits. Lawsuits. By the way, we said this years ago, years ago. Yep. You're not doing this. You're doing this because of politics. Yep. Of uh, Because of a political narrative. You're not doing it because it's related to medical science at all. And you're going to get burned big time with litigation on this. Yep. It's going to happen.
You're listening to Red Eye Radio from the Uniden America Studios. It's Red Eye Radio. He's Eric Carlin. and I'm Gary McNamara. So wholesale inflation numbers come out today. Yeah, right? the okay. uh, producer price index, as they call it. And, and basically, um, that tells us what those underlying costs are, you know, uh, for producers. And what's going on there? And let's see what the the median forecast is actually. Hmm. Well, let me see. Let me make sure I got this right. Because, yeah, the median forecast on PPI and core PPI is down considerably from the previous month. Uh, we'll see if that actually pans out. Uh, those numbers come out at eight thirty Eastern. Uh, going from on the the PPI numbers. Point six last month or the previous month, uh, February, to point three on the median forecast for March. We'll see if that holds. On core PPI, point four for February, and the median forecast at point two. Again, we'll see if it holds. And what would be the drivers behind it? If it's if it is dropping, what does that tell us about the economy going forward? Um, what's the consumer doing? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so Friday is the consumer sentiment preliminary numbers, and it looks to be fairly consistent with the previous month of February. Um, but, again, when you look at the inflation, and we talked about the um, super core inflation, these are the things you have to pay for, mm-hmm. the things you have to buy. Right. Being at an annualized rate right now, so far this year, of 8%. Yeah, I know. That's massive. And it te- what it tells me is that the April numbers are not going to be in- any better than the March numbers on inflation. And and that we could we could well be getting back into, again, this inflation that... How do you get on top of it? How do you – they're not serious about it at the Fed. Um, I think too little, too late. Uh, you know, starting with this bogus response that inflation is transitory. And then all of a sudden, massive inflation. Uh, the first of its kind at that level for a generation. And then – now you're at the point where it's so big, I don't know what you would have to do. I don't know what your target rate at the Fed would have to be on interest rates in order to get on top of it. It should have been somewhere in the area of 8%. And right now on the high end, the, the target rate is 5.5 after raising it. So I don't I don't know what you would have to do uh, to tell the market you're serious about inflation. And the moment you raise it, even a quarter of a point, you're telling the market you were wrong about all this and you still haven't a clue and you're still not serious about any of it. Uh, you and I have always been looking for what the actual numbers are that impact the average person the most with it. We've just like we have criticism with the GDP because mm. the GDP, if you look at what, what makes an economy go, it's the uh, the increase in the. Uh, in the uh, the increase in the production of goods and services. That's what really drives an economy. Right. And we've talked about that many times before. And proud of the problem of the GDP, especially when they changed it a lot of times, doesn't it doesn't look at that. Uh, you know, you could look at the transfer of money or money being put into a new project, which is viewed as economic growth when it's not economic growth yet. And so we've always worried about and said, you know, they throw all these things at you but how does that really reflect what is really happening? And one of our fears is that we see how the government will change the definition of everything. Mm-hmm. We've seen it. I mean, to the point where what's a woman, I can't tell you. Well, what are the numbers that really give you an idea of what's going on in economic growth or inflation? And so you've got to have researchers. You know, the Wall Street Journal came out the other day and said, okay, we looked at what people actually buy. Yeah. What the average grocery list is. And it's up 37% since tw- since uh, before COVID started. Yeah. So 
37% at that point. And you're talking about, you know, things like milk, butter, cereal, toilet paper, detergent, you know, all those all those kind of, of things that uh, that uh, that people buy. Eggs, you took the – because if you, if you put all food on there, there's a lot of food that people don't buy, where the masses don't buy. It's not mm-hmm. the average person. And so we've looked at that. The other thing we looked at is – Let's look at things like electricity. Let's look at natural gas. Let's look at homeowners insurance. Let's look at car insurance. Uh, mortgage rates, for example, are, are important. Car, you know, the the interest rates because it shows an increase in you know the increase in the interest rate, uh, you know, is going to affect you. We've looked at the mandates of electric vehicles and how much more gasoline vehicles are costing in order to subsidize the cost of of uh, of that, mm. and so. Uh, it was great to see CNBC come out with what they call the super core inflation numbers. And the super core inflation numbers is sort of what we've been talking about. And that's the stuff that you have no choice but to buy. And it says markets are buzzing about an even more specific price gauge contained within the data, the so-called super core inflation reading. The gauge measures inflation or ser- measures services uh Inflation, the gauge measures services inflation, excluding food, energy, and housing, Mm -hmm. and has been roaring higher lately, up 4.8% year over year in March, and more than eight at an 8% uh, rate at the three month annualized pace for for all this year. It's going at an 8% rate. The picture is more complicated uh, because some of the most stubborn components of service services inflation are household necessities like car and housing insurance as well as property taxes well we got a big cut here in the state of texas on that one Mm, yeah and so when they look at it and they say eight you know uh eight percent and so there is worry about that right now but i think it's important to put that into perspective that you look at that amount and then you look at still wages are down since biden has been president uh, wages still haven't caught up to the inflation overall. Mm-hmm. And over the past year that they were touting that uh, it was doing great, that that uh, wages were uh, increasing more than inflation. I think it was Wall Street Journal put a report, seven cents. Hmm. And the thing is, what do you do to get rid of this? And you and I look at this. I remember the last time we had inflation like this. You and I have agreed from the beginning the Fed and the government doesn't seem to be serious on getting rid of inflation. Some of the analysis out there even yesterday has mirrored what we have said. It's not just about raising interest rates. It's about the incredible debt now that's out there and the incredible spending. And this government is telling you, this administration is telling you, they're attempting to uh, solve the problem of inflation when they want to increase the debt and they want massive government spending that will put, you know, cash into the economy at the same time right. that they're trying to uh, constrict products out there like energy, they're they're trying to limit the availability of major things that you need, which is skyrocketing the cost of those things. And one example they gave was electricity. Right. And, and and we brought up the fact of the mandates for EVs that has skyrocketed the cost of all automobiles and then the interest rate that goes with it. All that adds to inflation. Yeah, I, it's it is such a big problem now because they weren't serious. The Fed wasn't serious about it. Um, that you and this idea of this soft landing uh, being able to prevent a recession. Well, really, it's only about being able to prevent a recession long enough to get through an election. And the question now is, OK, you've got it up to a target rate on the high end of five and a half. Uh, you should have gone much higher in order to get on top of inflation. The reality is what's going to shape the uh, the election, and that is inflation and the inability to borrow uh, cheap money. All those things being gone and in play now, you have rent skyrocketing, groceries skyrocketing, and as they get into the super core inflation now, insurance rates, 
through the roof. And as debt goes up, as individual debt goes up, especially unsecured credit card debt goes up, it affects your FICO, your your credit rating. And with a lower credit score, you're going to pay higher insurance costs. That's the way it is. And so that has a compounding effect on top of all the inflationary pressure of everything else. This is like, this is almost like the, you know, uh, the value added tax, the VAT tax. And, and, you know, if you were to break it down, how big it would be if we had a VAT tax here. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a lot like that. This is, I mean, if you, you think about the inflation and the way it's hitting, because this is done by the government, this overspending was done. And then the increase in the interest rates, which didn't get us far enough, but got us far enough to slow things down to where interest rates now are prohibitive for people that want to get into a, you know, maybe buy a home or do something like that. So they're just prohibitive enough. And you're not going to lower them because you do that and inflation is going to be even hotter. You're not going to raise them because you do that. You tell the market you were wrong officially. I don't know. I have no idea what this looks like come November. I really don't. I, it's, I don't. Here's what I don't know. I don't see anything reversing what's going on, this trend with inflation ticking up more and more. And what do you do? I don't know. Politically, Powell's right in the heat of the game. You're going to pull a move where you increase rates? No. You ignore inflation and lower rates? No. Well... We also looked at this as, you know, because that was the political thing. We're going to have a soft landing and uh, where, you know, we're not going to, you know, get into a, uh, you know, recession. Um, And I've always thought, well, you might want to get into a recession to get out of inflation (laughs) because I always believed inflation is much worse than a recession. But if you have a recession following great inflation, that's also no picnic, especially if it's big. It's a double whammy in a different way. Because if, if, if they're separated by by a decade, <laughs> recession, inflation, well, then it may be easier to handle. But maybe the one-two punch is they view it in politics that that would be just too hard. Well, because, you know, you if you get on top of it soon enough, like with anything, then the remedy uh, is, is, is hard, but it's, it doesn't take as long. Yeah. The longer you wait, and this is the case with inflation, the longer you wait... In order to get on top of it, they would have to make such a huge jump. And it's not going to happen. I'm convinced it won't happen. In interest rates, you would have to force a pretty uh, decent recession. And for how long? I, I can't tell you that. But the problem has been left here for far too long. They weren't serious about it in the beginning. And now the flames have engulfed the entire structure. You ready for this? The Fed will have a hard, this is from CNBC, not a conservative outlet. Right. The Fed will have a hard time bringing down inflation with more rate hikes because the current drivers are stickier and not as sensitive to tighter monetary policy. Exactly. He cautioned, Fitzpatrick said the recent upward moves in inflation are more closely related to tax increases. Yeah. Tax increases. What? Yeah. No, I mean, that's what they, that's the way. Uh, That's and that's it. You know, that's why I compared it to a VAT tax. It's compounding and it's at the hands of the government. And that's how people feel. I've 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 heard uh, at least one or two comedians comment on it. Well, they gave us all these handouts during covid and now we're giving it all back 10, 20 fold. They feel like they're being taxed. Eight, six, six, 90 red eye. Lines open for your calls. 866-90-RED-EYE on Red Eye Radio. In Red Eye Radio, he's Eric Carlin. I'm Gary McNamara. Yeah, it was Tom Fitzgerald, or Fitzpatrick, Managing Director of the Global Markets Insight at R.J. O'Brien and Associates 
was talking about the fact that it this isn't an inflation you might be able to cure just by raising rates. That right. you got to it's got it. Congress has to stop the spending and the tax increases. We talked about it's easy for everybody to figure out. You know, let's raise the let's raise it on the evil corporations. Well, you raise taxes on corporations and they pass them on. They pass the cost on to the consumer. It's everything. Right. That raises the rates. And who does it hurt the most? The poor. Yep. And and so when you look at this here and you, they're saying, too, you know, too much debt, uh, you know, too much cash, you know, being put still that the uh, Democrats want to put in to the economy as they constrict the production of goods out there. Right. Which is like energy. That's why electricity prices are going up. Yep. And a bunch of other things that they mentioned. It's like, uh oh. This is Red Eye Radio on Westwood One.